Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I'm joined by Evan Berry, Assistant Professor of Environmental Humanities in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religious Studies at Arizona State University, and author of Devoted to Nature, The Religious Roots of American Environmentalism. Evan and I discuss apocalyptic narratives in the environmental crisis, the tension between fear and hope, and community versus individualism. Also, please be sure to subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts, or subscribe to the YouTube channel if that is where you view this. Also, hit that like button and notification bell. Your support is truly appreciated. Evan Berry is an assistant professor of environmental humanities in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religious Studies at Arizona State University. His research examines the relationship between religion and the public sphere in contemporary societies, with special attention to the way religious ideas and organizations are mobilized in response to climate change and other global environmental challenges. Berry is the author of Devoted to Nature, The Religious Roots of American Environmentalism, which traces the influence of Christian theology on the environmental movement in the United States. Barry recently spent a year as a Franklin Fellow at the State Department's Office of Religion and Global Affairs as the American Academy of Religion's inaugural Religion and International Relations Fellow. He also serves as the President-elect of the International Society for the Study of Religion, Nature, and Culture, and is the Chair of the American Academy of Religion's Committee for the Public Understanding of Religion. Evan, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Yes, well, thank you. I'm looking forward to speaking with you. As I told you before hitting record, in the past, I have done research when I was a doctoral student. I did research on the rhetoric of apocalypse in terms of in the environmental crises that we're facing. And I've recently been thinking about this quite a bit. And I was doing a search, this is how I found you, is I discovered the uh, Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict and the Apocalyptic Narrative and Climate Change Program at uh, Arizona State University. So I thought that we could start there. And maybe you could say a bit about the center and specifically the research on apocalyptic narratives and climate change. Sure. So uh, I came to Arizona State University uh, one semester before the pandemic, in the, in the before times, hmm. as it were. And my colleagues here had already started this uh, grant proposal. Uh, it was in its early stages, and I've joined on to the project since being here. So the, the basic premise of the, of the project is that in public narratives about climate change, the idea that it's the end of the world or that we're living in apocalyptic times is everywhere. It's in uh, popular fiction, it's in disaster movies, it's in the kinds of language that uh, policymakers and advocates use to describe what's going on. And so the grant project just wanted to try to make some sense of that by uh, putting it in a conversation with scholarship and religious studies. So I think a few key questions uh, were the ones that we've been trying to focus on. So one of those is around the tension between fear and hope. Mm -hmm. So in apocalyptic uh, communities and apocalyptic theologies, uh, the moment of apocalypse, the sort of uh, crisis uh, at the center of those kinds of narratives is at the same time uh, a moment of destruction and a moment of creation. So we were thinking, uh, and we've been trying to think about whether or not speaking about climate change as the end of the world uh, demobilizes people, whether it's something that uh, makes people feel despair and hopelessness about uh, extinction, about uh, the futures uh, for human civilization, for, for our children, Uh, or whether those kinds of ideas that this world is coming to an end and that something uh, is promised beyond it, some new new beginning uh, for uh, social organization is possible, uh, was a kind of hopefulness embedded in that language. Hmm. So uh, the project really, I think, has turned on that core question about whether or not apocalyptic rhetoric is uh, good or bad uh, for 
advancing action on climate change. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I thought I had a quote here somewhere, but I, um, oh yes, I do. Um, I, I was in reviewing some of the work, this just came to mind with what you were saying. Um, uh, I had read a book a long time ago, uh, just called Apocalypses and, by uh, Eugene Weber. And he was looking at the book of Revelation and he said, you know, over 400 verses in the Apocalypse of John, only 98 of them speak of calamity, whereas mm -hmm. something like 150 refer to joy and hope and brightness. Um, so it seems to me that uh, this tension between hope and fear is right on target in terms of apocalyptic thinking. And uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask of you was how your understanding apocalypse, and you've already mentioned this a little bit, but I would like to invite you to go a little bit deeper, because I think that most people, when they hear the word apocalypse, they think of it in terms of the end of the world. But I think that it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And I think that there are many meanings to apocalypse. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit, you know, how are you understanding apocalypse or the different ways uh, that you see it manifest in these conversations? Yeah, that's great. So uh, the word apocalypse comes from the Greek apocalypsis, uh, which more literally could be translated to revealing or revelation. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a historical moment at which some underlying fundamental truth about uh, reality is uh, revealed to people. And so you can see clearly how something like the book uh, of Revelations uh, at the end of the, the New Testament uh, is a story about how a final revelation of God's word is revealed to the community of believers. Uh, and essentially, uh, the promises of the biblical arc as a whole are fulfilled with sort of no ambiguities or doubters or uh, sort of all the all of the narratives embedded in the Bible come to a final and permanent close. So it does have that sort of um, moment of finality and ending of the world, but really I think the term apocalypse should be understood in terms of how uh, the believers, the people who uh, are orienting themselves to that moment of revelation, uh, the kinds of work that the, that that orientation does on forming social communities, on thinking about what is revealed, about what is destroyed and stripped away, right? So one of the, the um, if you imagine in your head what a revealing is, it is not just a showing of what's behind or underneath, but also a removing of that which obscures or um, makes it unclear to people what's going on. So in some sense, uh, that language can be really helpful for talking about the climate crisis, that there is something going on where uh, the structures and processes and language that we have that obscures the deep crisis that, that uh, certain powerful humans in uh, relatively recent history have created for all life on earth, uh, those groups are hidden. It's not obvious to everybody exactly who's responsible and exactly the extent of that crisis. And so bringing to light those truths also involves a stripping away of uh, veils of ignorance. And so that sort of coming into knowledge uh, uh, transition, uh, I think that's one of the, the powerful aspects of apocalyptic rhetoric in climate discourse that helps get at that that feature of what's going on. I, I recently, there, there were some events recently, I, I can say more about them here on campus related to this grant project. And a number of the participants uh, used this language of um, when they woke up, right? This, um, I, in our conversation earlier, you were talking about the language of enlightenment. Many people sort of point to a particular moment at which um, the magnitude and uh, force of the climate crisis uh, became evident to them. And they, they locate that as a particular moment of revealing, right? Mm -hmm. So this, this language, I think, um, 
stays with us at the, at the individual level in particular. But I don't think it's without problems. Right. And what might some of those problems be? Uh, so uh, <laughs> in many of the apocalyptic communities that you see in the early centuries of the common era, like those that would have grown up around uh, the teachings of John or uh, the, the communities at Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls are, uh, those communities saw the world as fundamentally corrupt and retreated from it in, um, to isolate themselves so that they could remain pure in their truth for the, the coming of whatever uh, apocalyptic moment was near on the horizon. And so there's a, a, a tendency, I think, in apocalyptic language to push people into isolation and um, sort of uh, creating cells to wait out and survive the apocalypse. So there's kind of a survivalist bent there that I think is worrisome because that's not how we're going to confront the climate crisis. Right. We need coordinated global interaction. We need broad uh, public commitments to justice. Uh, we need technology and innovation. We need uh, good governance. There's a lot of things we need and running away and hiding in a cave is probably not a good solution. Right. Yeah. And um, I want to come back to something you just said, but first a, what immediately came to mind is um, also this idea of not just secluding oneself, uh, but the inaction from some people. I was thinking specifically of uh, Reagan's uh, Secretary of the Interior, uh, James Watts. And uh, he famously said when he was being interviewed by uh, Congress, I think, uh, 1981, uh, something like, I don't know how many future generations we can count on until the Lord returns. And that seemed to be an excuse for inaction. So uh, I can't uh, let that anecdote go without um, citing one of my friends and colleagues, Robin Veldman. Uh, her book, uh, The Gospel of Climate Skepticism, is a really great book about uh, sort of uh, the religious right and conservative Christians in the United States and uh, sort of an ethnographic engagement with their thinking on climate change and environmental politics. Uh, but in that book, there is a chapter on what she calls the end times apathy hypothesis, mm. which it sort of turns on this story about Watt's testimony, uh, mm. you know, where he makes this, this remark. Uh, and that's, that's absolutely um, one of the worries that some people have around apocalypticism. If you believe that the end of the world is nigh, uh, it destabilizes the ability to galvanize action in the mm. present. Mm -hmm because we're just waiting and that the often the forces that bring about um, the apocalypse are beyond human control which is distinct from the climate crisis because it's very much uh, caused by particular humans and particular kinds of human activity and so we can do something about it it's not uh, merely in god's hands as it were right right and wouldn't another issue, this is just something that comes to mind, is when this apocalyptic rhetoric is used, and I think it is appropriate because we are facing something that's so extreme, um, but it is often used to disregard it in the sense of it's just being referred to as alarmist. Yeah. So, Michelle Barkun has written about this issue of, of when prophecy fails. Mm. Uh, there are many examples of apocalyptic religious communities uh, who stood waiting at the altar of the end of the world uh, only to find themselves jilted by uh, a, a partner that never arrived. Uh, this is actually a concern of mine about climate change, that the narrative structure of apocalypse really rests on the idea that there will be a moment uh, mm. of revelation, that the, a, a world will end. Uh, and that's not how ecology works. I mean, there are tipping points 
but tipping points are usually things that are understood retroactively. Uh, I think, you know, those of us who follow climate issues closely are all familiar with the, the boiled frog analogy, this idea that we're uh, being sort of slowly submerged in a, in a worsening situation. Um, that, that rings true to me in terms of how we experience the climate crisis. Fire seasons in places like California are getting worse. Drought seasons in the, the desert Southwest are getting worse. Uh, flood and, co and storms are getting worse. But those are all things that existed before climate change was a, a, a problem and will exist um, many thousands of years from now when climate change is no longer a problem. So the question is sort of about our experience and our ability to adapt and how quickly those, those kinds of uh, uh, environmental pressures mount. But I doubt that it'll be all at once, which is uh, uh, one of the reasons why I think apocalypticism is part of a sort of narrative strategy around climate change, but it's not necessarily something we want to put all our, our eggs in that one basket because, uh, yeah, this is going to be with us for a long time and it will continue to heighten until we finally do something about it and we won't know when that finally decide to do something is about it until uh years later i don't think there's any one moment in which global policy will be finally and permanently resolved right yeah and you hear i hear people a lot speaking along those lines as if there's going to be a massive hurricane and then finally people are going to wake up to the reality of climate change. Uh, but we've seen so many climate disasters along the way and that has yet to happen. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's yet to happen in the United States. I would say that many other former British colonies, right, countries that are part of the industrialized uh, world, uh, wealthy nations, nations with, uh, you know, right left dichotomies that look like uh, they were learned from the British model. So I'm thinking here of Australia and Canada and New Zealand. Many of those countries 15 or 20 years ago had debates around climate change that looked a lot like the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's happened in Australia over the last 10 or 15 years especially the wildfires from a few years ago, I think really shifted the needle on public opinion in Australia, where there are still uh, uh, pro-coal, pro-fossil fuel forces on the right, but outright denial is no longer a mainstream political viability. Mm. Uh, it is still here in the United States. One can still yeah. pretend as if it is, quote unquote, a Chinese hoax and be elected right. to the highest office. Yeah, yeah, which is unfortunate. And uh, I have concerns for the future elections as well along those same lines. Um, there seems to be, if I understand correctly, within apocalyptic thinking, there is always a sort of moral aspect to it, isn't there? Um, where there's um, not just basic morality, but issues of social justice. And it seems to me that this is one of the ways, you know, we've been talking about some of the ways that this rhetoric is negative, but this seems a way that it can be very affirming. Yeah, uh, I think that's a really interesting question. I think it kind of cuts to some of the complexities around apocalyptic thinking. So Typically, apocalyptic communities have been politically marginalized groups who see themselves as the keepers of moral truth in a world that's gone astray, and that preserving that truth uh, is an important part of how to maintain fidelity uh, to the divine order, and that that will eventually be rewarded, right? That the apocalypse is a revealing, but essentially what it is, is it's a redistribution of justice. It's an attempt to correct some wrongs that are in that exist in the material world. Uh, that's all well and good, and I don't think that always necessarily means social justice, right? You could have apocalyptic communities who believe that they are the keepers of truth, and that the truth is some sort of rigid hierarchy around sexuality or gender, and that you know at the revealing at the 
the divine, at the moment of divine revealing, um, those sort of rigid hierarchies will be restored to their rightful place. So the kinds of justice imagined in apocalypticism aren't always in line uh, with how we might want progressive social justice values to be uh, articulated. I also think another complexity that arises when you think about justice um, is around whose world is threatened and who those groups are. So one way to talk about the climate apocalypse is to think about the world as a whole, as ending, mm -hmm. that there is a planet and that that planet is somehow uniquely at a precarious moment because of anthropogenic carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases. Uh, and that's true. The planet is a single uh, biogeophysical system and that system is imperiled in ways now that it never has been uh, in all of human history. And it's imperiled for reasons having to do with human activity. One of the, another way to look at it is that is, there isn't in fact just one world, there's many worlds, that worlds and planets are different things, that people live in worlds and that the particular world that is coming to, the, to an end isn't the planet, it's sort of the, the modern era, right? The, the era of ascendant fossil fuel, of uh, Euro-American dominance over the entire planet that began with colonialism, that was you know, aided and abetted by uh, the free and cheap energy we get from fossil fuels, that that moment in history is what's ending and that that is one of the reasons why so many forces in sort of the Western media imagine this as the end of the world. But other worlds have already ended, right? So there are a number of indigenous scholars uh, and, and writers. I'm thinking of people like Kyle Powis White and uh, Julian Brave Noisecat and Tara Hauschka and others who've written about sort of whose world it is that's ending. And this is just like the settlers figuring out what we've been saying for, and I, I don't mean we, I mean, this is uh, native uh, writers expressing um, frustration that settler communities are only now seeing the ends of worlds when that's something that those communities have been grappling with and living through for centuries. So I think another, this is another place where apocalyptic thinking can be really valuable if you open it up to not talk about the singular end of the world, but a kind of, um, narrative structure that helps communities live in relationship uh, to ecological systems. So when those worlds end, those communities have to find ways to live through and beyond the apocalypse. And I think a lot can be gleaned from that because we're all on the precipice of living through the end of this world. Right. Yeah. And I appreciate that quite a bit. Uh, whenever I teach, um, I regularly teach a Near Eastern religion class. So we always cover the book of Apocalypse. And I always explain it as, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it's the end of a world. And my understanding is that it was the end of this, it was this antidote to Rome's brutality in this system of oppression, right? And that's why Jesus was always referring to the kingdom of heaven, um, that it was a more moral alternative to this system of oppression that they experienced. So I, I definitely appreciate uh, that insight quite a bit. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you about is because you've written about the uh, roots of American environmentalism um, in the specifically, I guess, Christian tradition here. In what ways do you think that apocalyptic thought may have informed that as well? Yeah. So I'll say a little something about how to make the connection between yes, please. theology yes. and environmental discourse. Yeah. So one way to, to describe that would be that there are certain things that happen in popular culture, in environmentalism, in movie narratives and superhero films that uh, rhyme with religious tradition, that we can see archetypes or borrowed images being recirculated and that that borrowing happens through the production of culture. So we might think about uh, the prevalence of apocalyptic language and climate reporting as uh, a 
tool that contemporary people rely on in order to make sense of their world, that they're sort of like casting about for, for ways of, of speaking about this, and they just happen upon uh, religious options for doing that. Another way to talk about it, and this is uh, more my view and sort of what my, my first uh, book, which is actually sitting on the shelf behind you for, <laughs> yes, for it readers is. and listeners, <laughs> uh, the, is to suggest that those connections have always been there. That in fact, um, there isn't sort of a moment in environmental thinking, especially in American culture, that wasn't built without reference to Christian theological principles. So the idea that human beings and uh, the natural order, uh, which is framed largely as creation, are uh, fundamentally separate, that human beings uh, exist on but are not of nature is kind of often implicit in the ways that we in the United States talk about ecology. Um, right, our decision making exists sort of out of outside of uh, ecology, uh, and that the uh, the particular character of American environmental history that this was a uh, pristine and beautiful continent prior to the arrival of European peoples, uh, that it was a veritable Garden of Eden, uh, and that uh, over time uh, humans have strayed from. Uh, appropriate moral behaviors and have fouled that garden and that we need to somehow uh, embrace principles that will allow us to restore that. So the, the, the core theology of the Genesis account often shows up in uh, uh, America. It's sort of buried and always at the foundations of how many, especially settler colonial uh, environmental voices have worked. I don't think that's changed. And I think that we can extrapolate that to talking about the apocalypse, that this narrative of what happens to human beings when they fall afoul of the preordained moral order, uh, God punishes them. So a sort of covenantal language around climate change, that this is our natural comeuppance for uh, sin, pridefulness, hubris. Um, and I actually don't think that's a, a problematic framing. But I think that um, being honest about how that vocabulary uh, has become and remain so powerful in American environmental discourse lets us be a little bit more truthful with uh, about our about how those conversations in the United States are structured and about what we can do with them, right? So I think our conversation here today, uh, and like much of many of the conversations I have in this space, are about what does it mean to explicitly talk about the religious quality of ecological conversations so that we can have them in a more sophisticated, more blatantly theological way. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that's really important. And I'm glad that you provided all of that uh, insight and detail, because I know that I always try to bring it up in class and students often, I don't know about your students, but students often initially don't see the connection. Um, but, you know, I always attempt to demonstrate how it's there, like you said, from the very beginning. And there are these attitudes. Um, and just like with apocalypse, I can see the attitudes of things you talked about the Eden narrative. You know, there's this idea that we are, and I think this comes from Carolyn Merchant, um, that, you know, we're always trying to recreate Eden, but then there was also these ideas of wilderness as being a place of moral confusion, you know, and something that has to be sort of conquered. But I think that also fits into <laughs> this idea of recreating Eden uh, in some ways. Yeah. Uh I don't want to go too far afield from right. our conversation about right, apocalypse, right, right, right. but I think this is relevant. Uh, so much of the conversation in the early generations of American environmentalism was focused on individuals preserving landscapes so that uh, people could go out and appreciate the beauty of creation. Mm -hmm. And this language of wilderness, which shows up time and again in both the Old and New Testaments, is about a, a space where um, spiritually significant figures are tested. So this idea of thinking of 
the landscape, thinking of the American West in particular as a place where people are morally tested and that if they endure um, their, their spiritual rigor and vitality is, is, is uh, proved. That emphasis on sort of forging individual character uh, isn't the direction we need to be going if we're thinking about how to confront the climate crisis. This is one of the places where making the connection between uh, theology and environmentalism, uh, I, I have real worries about what it means to focus on individuals because the only way we're going to persevere and create a sustainable future is by forming robust communities with solidarity, both among humans and also between humans and our other than human kin. That's the only way we're going to persevere. So this language of moral individualism that's so central in the Christian theological drama uh, isn't maybe the most helpful right. view here. Maybe right. uh, a Jewish perspective on sort of a covenant between a people uh, and a land is right. more appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> that's, that's one of my major critiques of contemporary, some forms of contemporary Christianity is that there seems to be this sort of embedded narcissism to it, um, that it's the individual and their relationship to God. And, you know, I always in the class, I always give an example of a friend of mine who uh, I don't know well, but uh, at one time was posting on social media how her car didn't start after work. And um, she was praying to God to get a ride home. And then she posts, you know, and I got the ride home. God loves me and everything. I'm like, there's Holocaust levels of genocide happening <laughs> in Africa. People are starving to death, uh, but God can make sure you get a ride home. Um and I think that's a deep problem uh, that needs to be overcome. Uh, but I also wanted to ask about, and maybe I don't know if this is problematic in terms of the individual, but I also see the apocalyptic language, as you mentioned, you know, a good translation is a kind of revealing. And it seems like that is also something that is at the heart of the environmental movement. I'm thinking in particular of some of the nature writings and especially, you know, like John Muir. And, you know, if you read Muir, it is this constant revelation. And I think one of the words that is most common uh, is glory. You know, he's always, you know, glory, glory, glory. Um, it, and it seems to me that that kind of revelation is important to get people to care about environmental concerns, isn't it? Yeah, I have my own feelings about Muir. Uh, yeah. I love the same places that he loves. Uh, you know, the Sierras are beautiful places. Uh, the redwood forests of the California coast are special to me. I know many of us who would describe ourselves as environmentalists have had those experiences of um, being sort of overwhelmed with positive emotions uh, because of something that happens in the woods. But this is exactly uh, what I was just talking about, sort of about uh, the challenge of individual awakening or individual moral fortitude as the as the, those are maybe moments in environmental activation, but they're not necessarily the final stage. So when I referred earlier to my, my colleagues uh, who were talking about waking up to the climate crisis, one of the, th the features of the account that those several persons were giving is that they were talking about having been aware that climate change was a problem, but seeing it in a new way that put them in relationship to others, right? Mm. So rather than just thinking about their personal carbon footprint or you know what they, how much they fly, they uh, decided that they needed to mobilize and become part of collective efforts. And I think that's a second step that often gets left out of the um, 
the Murian account. I mean, mm. Muir famously did uh, found an organization that has been instrumental in uh, protecting the environment in the United States and beyond. Uh, and that organization has, uh, in especially recent years, done a ton to make up for some of its shortcomings, right? It was largely based on protecting landscapes that had originally been peopled uh, and clearing the people out of those landscapes, right. um, you know, sort of uh, aligning the project of the National Parks Program with the ongoing genocide of, of Native peoples. Uh, and the Sierra Club has sort of formally recognized that and, and worked on that. So Muir did see that collective action is necessary. The Sierra Club is uh, a, I think, worthy organization in a lot of ways, but waking up can't just be about uh, one's interior mental or emotional state. It's about uh, the experience of coming into community with others. And I would also include in that, you know, one of my favorite conversion stories or revelation moments in all of nature writing is uh, all the Leopold's encounter with the wolf at Eskidio right. Mountain. Yeah. Uh, and this encounter between um, himself as uh, a moral agent and the wolf, which is a kind of community, right? And I think that our, our ways of, of waking up need to be about seeing the more than just the human and the more than just our own interests, which is increasingly hard in the sort of mm -hmm. capitalist hall of mirrors that we live in, right? It's very difficult to see beyond needing to start your car to get home from work in a landscape where automobiles are essential. Uh, it's very hard to see out of that and into something more morally significant. We're yeah. almost, you could say, in need of a revelation, right? Right, right. Well, and it, brings to mind also that I think the apocalyptic rhetoric can help in that sense. I'm thinking specifically like uh, Rachel Carson and the publication of Silent Spring, which I think really made people aware of some of the negative aspects of you know, the petrochemicals, uh, and not just on human health, but the health of ecosystems. And um, uh, I'm also thinking in terms of groups like uh, Earth First that seem to be operating under or in acting out of a um, apocalyptic concerns. Um, is would you say that that is because I guess I'm kind of um, I know I'm stumbling here a little bit. I'm trying to formulate this good question, um, uh, but one of my concerns and maybe this is an individual aspect to things is with this language of awakening and enlightenment is all too often it is couched. It's always couched in terms of truth, but while we have people who can have this experience or this greater awareness of environmental tragedy unfolding you also have people who will say well you need to wake up that the united nations is lying to us and agenda 21 blah 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 and that's my great concern is and why i'm always suspicious of this language of awakening um how do we reconcile these truths <laughs> yeah uh i think that that is such a huge question and yeah. I don't feel like I've got a great answer for right. it because I think it's one of, uh, I mean, I, I take that to be sort of the challenge. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard to differentiate between apocalyptic languages that we use to talk about the climate crisis and what people on the far right would call red pilling, right? Like mm -hmm. this idea that the world as you know it is a, a sham and that uh, some sort of exit into a different moral order is necessary. Those truths behind what the current world obscures are irreconcilable. And what really scares me is uh, that one of those truths, or you know, maybe a family of those different truths, uh, 
pretend violence mm -hmm. and the kind of uh, revealing that climate activists would point to as necessary is one that is anti-violence. Mm -hmm. It's about ceasing the violence that is the status quo as opposed to um, seeing the status quo as needing violent correction. It, it's a, we live in scary times to be sure. Yeah. You can really understand why uh, I think the climate crisis is no longer contained merely in a conversation about planetary ecology or UN policy, but it's connected to everything, right? It's connected to conversations about racism and militias and, you know, economic uh, infrastructures and every, I mean, it's everything everywhere all at once, as it were. Yeah. What's the phrase for it? It's a wicked problem. It's a wicked problem. Yeah. Yeah. And you point, I think, specifically to one of the, the most wicked dimensions, which is mm -hmm. uh, the kinds of apocalyptic language that exist among denialists, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, like I said, this is one of the things I'm kind of focused on right now. And I've just come to a general distrust of the language of awakening and enlightenment, hmm. um, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. Um, I recently was watching a, um, a panel that had uh, Jeffrey Kripal on it from uh, Rice University, and he said something that he always tells his graduate students um, that don't trust your first conversions or something like that. You know, it's like, you know, I think a lot of times people have this experience of changing that worldview. And he's like, you know, wait until it happens again. Because when it happens again, you're going to be a little bit more skeptical uh, about things, hmm. which I think is appropriate. Hmm. Um, and that maybe that is sort of the way, you know, because my concern with this language of enlightenment and awakening is the certainty that's involved. And that maybe what we all need to be able to do, especially as the world is undergoing changes because the climate is to learn how to surf uncertainty yeah i i totally agree with that i think i'll keep harping on this question of of individualism and collectivity sure. i think uh conversions are often especially if we narrate them using the the language of evangelical christianity the experience of being born again is an experience of an individual entering into a newfound personal relationship with Jesus, which is very hard to prevent from becoming an exercise in solipsism. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does it mean to be converted into experience of deep solidarity? What does it mean to live in communities where uh, the wisdom of multiple generations stays with a group of people and that sort of uh, uh, supersedes any one person's uh, emotional whims based on an experience they had, right? Like, I don't know. I think one of the, the kinds of things we need to do around climate change is really decenter ourselves as, as individuals who can do something about it. I think it's really bad for us uh, mm -hmm. psychologically to imagine that somehow our actions can be the difference because we're never going to solve this any one of us it will never be able to do have any meaningful impact by our by ourselves mm -hmm. so all meaningful impact we can have is through work we do together and so finding ways to bring people into that experience of wanting to action that seems to me like a second order conversion like you're saying yeah. people can wake be awake to the problem um, but you need to be awake to the fact that it's not just about you. And that's right. here. I think I'm speaking largely to American audiences. I think yeah. uh, folks who are working on the climate crisis uh, in other cultural contexts probably see this differently. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's a good point. It makes me think that uh, often the solutions that we're given are focused on the individual. 
you know, drive less, take shorter showers, eat less meat. And all of those are important. But like you said, none of them are going to solve the crisis, right? you know, until we work together. So, um, so march, at the, march on the Supreme Court until they overturn yeah. Citizens United and get yeah. fossil fuel money out of politics. I mean, that's, yeah. that's not sure. something you can do. Uh, it's not five easy hacks to like, you know, mm-hmm. make your diet greener. It's right. It's kind of revolution or bust at this point. Yeah, yeah. And I hope to see groups and activities like Extinction Rebellion kind of taking on more fire here in the United States uh, because it's absolutely necessary. And to that end, I, I'm curious, since you're a educator, how do you see your students now? Um, what are What do you find their thoughts, their reactions to all of this is? Yeah, I'm an educator and I'm an educator at a public university in Arizona. Uh, Always in my classes, I have students uh, who are from abroad. Always in my classes, I have students who are not from Arizona. And so it's really interesting to sort of hear where, how students arrive to conversations about climate change and the environment. Many of my students from Arizona uh, are frustrated that they didn't get more. Mm-hmm. They know because they're literate people and, and savvy users of social media that the climate crisis is an issue that will be with them for a long time, that will shape their adult lives. They know this, uh, but also see pretty clearly that they had minimal education on it. It was covered in like a one or two day unit in their junior year, Mm. you know, science class. Uh, It's not something that really comes up that much in humanities classes. So they haven't really had opportunities to think about um, how different communities experience climate change. They haven't really had an opportunity to think about um, whether trees have moral standing, the kinds of questions that our young people need to be Mm-hmm. having opportunities to grapple with. Uh, m- many of the students, uh, both those from abroad, many of the students who are working on sustainability have um, deeply informed views about the kinds of technologies and policies that are going to be necessary to help tackle this issue and, and make, you know, make this crisis less bad. But they also, it's many of those students experience this as the first time they've had an opportunity to talk about climate change and their feelings or climate change as something that isn't just uh, a technology problem. I mean, if you're training to work in the solar energy field, then you're developing a a professional career trajectory, but solar engineers aren't really stopping to talk about uh, apocalypticism they're right, not right. really spending a lot of time like geeking out on like the meaning of disaster movies so i think i think young people are hungry for those kinds of conversations i think those are really important to make sure that anybody who's pursuing an education uh in any field especially folks who want to go into sort of sustainability related careers or want to do that work as something that's important to them should have opportunities to sort of explore the moral and spiritual dimensions of the crisis. Yeah. 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 I agree. The, one of my inspirations, I think is a, and you're probably familiar with it. It's a essay by David Orr on what is education for. And in that he specifically says all education should be environmental education. And I always kind of shift the language a little bit and say, I think it ought to be ecological education. Um, and I don't think he would disagree with that. No, probably um, not. Um, but one of my concerns and interests, and you know, this is probably a more personal question as an educator as well, because I have the same experience that often my students have a vague awareness, but they don't really understand the gravity of the situation often. Um, But I struggle at institutions like, you know, I teach at what is considered one of the best community colleges in the nation, and they don't even offer environmental ethics. Hmm. And I was at a um, 
uh, on Earth Day Friday, uh, there was at a different district, a seminar on sustainability. And this was also for a community, you know, one of the largest community college districts in the nation. And there was a lot of talk about sustainability, but there was nothing in terms of how to incorporate it into the classroom. You know, so it seems to me that, you know, and I imagine that there are some groups, you know, maybe, through, you know, like committees on the American Academy of Religion and whatnot that helps people, but it seems like educators that we also need to organize in order to start getting this implemented um, into the curriculums and into the classrooms. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I have my uh, own concerns about what it means to be an educator in uh, a conservative state where these kinds of questions can be pretty hot button. Uh, but Arizona State is in the process of redesigning its gen ed curriculum, and it will include a sustainability element as one of the core principles. And exactly what that looks like and, and what the shape is, is yet to be determined. But I think it's going to have something around uh, culture and ethics and uh, moral and uh, reasoning, right? We don't exactly know what it'll look like, but those, those are critical factors that universities should be onboarding in terms of how they think about what it means to form citizens, to help young people develop the skills and uh, critical thinking skills that they need to navigate the decades ahead. There's just no way we're gonna engineer ourselves out of this right. if we don't right. know what the problem is that we're solving, right? It's not, yeah. I mean, to me, this is, I, I, we could call it the lithium problem, right? Yeah. Like yeah. we can solve the fossil fuel problem by, uh, converting all of our energy sources to rare earth minerals and lithium, but then right. we've just moved the extractive industries into different countries, and we have the same kinds of radical economic uh, just injustice that we have, the yeah. same kinds of localized uh, pollution, uh, and uh, kinds of toxicity that we don't even understand, right? So we can like move on from the climate crisis into some other crisis, but if we're not thinking about what the roots of the problem are, uh, then we come up with piecemeal solutions. Right. So students need to be able to have the question, the conversation at that level, which means that educators, I think you're absolutely right, need to be fighting for the opportunities to have to, to let young people have those conversations. Young people are ready to have those conversations. Yeah. They just yeah. need the time and space away from their parents to have them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always want to say that if we're, if the focus is on student success, we cannot have student success if we ignore this problem. You know, we need to help students have the tools to maneuver through a radically changing world, you know. Um, so I know we got a little bit off the topic here of the apocalypse, but as an educator, I'm always uh, interested in these ideas. Um, I know that we're running out of time. Uh, I have just a couple of final questions for you. Great. Uh, one, to get back to this idea of apocalypse and these, this uh, tension between fear and hope. One of the questions I like to ask some of my guests is, are you hopeful? No. No? Uh, I, maybe I say that too, too flatly. <laughs> There's a little bit of, maybe that's a little bit psychotic. I don't know. I, I actually, I had a conversation with a friend. I remember that the conversation took place in late 1999 as the sort of Y2K hysteria was in the air, but also in thinking about then Vice President Gore's electoral campaign and uh, how little his, his concerns about climate change appeared to resonate with voters at the time. Our concern in that conversation was that there was never going to be some event that brought people around to the problem of climate change. I really do think that we, this is a matter of infinitesimal degrees. I think we've adapted very easily to life in a more uh, 
risky, precarious, unjust world. In the last 25 years, the world's gotten significantly hotter. Storms and fires and droughts have become more common and more intense. Uh, the economic gap between the richest and the poorest has gotten much wider and very little has changed. Policy is basically where it was. So I think that and I don't, I, I actually, uh, this is a place where I think apocalyptic thinking can help us because I think uh, we have to remain in community and we have to fight even when uh, you don't think that it is going to work. I think one of the problems of apocalyptic thinking is that there's a certainty uh, that you know, justice will prevail and that, that that path is somehow written into the fabric of history by the hand of God. Uh, I don't think that's how history works at all. I think we have to fight the fight now to lay the groundwork for the other kinds of worlds that get rebuilt out of the ashes of this one. I don't see our way of life surviving through to the end of this century. And I think that a lot of shit's gonna happen between now and then. And I'm not happy yeah. about that. I'm not yeah. cynical about that. Um, but I don't think that hope is the right virtue. Right, right. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. And I see that we have, entered into the dark night, you know, um, and there may or may not be an awakening at the end. There may or may not be um, some kind of revelation towards the end, but we're in the, and I don't know that many of us know it's like that frog in the water that, you know, I think too many of us are unaware of the fact that we are in the darkness right now. Yeah. So. Maybe, maybe one thing I could say uh, is that you know, especially around sort of Obama's use of the word hope mm -hmm. and then what happened at the end of eight years of uh, an Obama, Obama's presidency, uh, you know, it collapsing into sort of an early form of uh, fascism. Mm -hmm. Whether hopefulness is the right language. Mm -hmm. Lots of people have very nuanced opinions about that. And I, I take them at their word. And I think hope can be uh, an important virtue for people to hang on to. I would say that we're in a time where courage uh, uh, is yeah. just as or more important, right? right? Hang on tight and keep doing the good work. Yeah. 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 And my approach is uh, I come at all of this from the point of view of a virtue, uh, environmental virtue ethicist. So I think many of the virtues are necessary uh, right now. Absolutely. Um, and that we're all called to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be, but that also connects us to the larger communities. Absolutely. What are you working on next? Um, or, and also if you want, what is the uh, apocalyptic uh, narratives and climate change group at uh, ASU working on too? Sure. Um, so uh, I actually have, I have a book that I've been, I've worked on for several years. It's an edited volume. Uh, it's coming out in a week or two. So I can oh, say a plug okay. for that. Um, it's part of a multi-year project on uh, climate change and, and international politics. Okay. It's So it's called Climate Politics and the Power of Religion. That's due out from Indiana University Press uh, in May. So just here in a couple of weeks, I think it'll be available. Um, that's uh, where my head's been for a long time. And as that book is now finalized, I'm thinking and working a lot more explicitly at the intersection between religion and fossil fuels. I'm thinking about the role of fossil fuel corporations in shaping uh, contemporary religious life, uh, the intersections of denial and religion, belief in climate change, those kinds of questions, in ways of sort of better characterizing how uh, the cultures of climate crisis can be understood through the lens of religious studies. So that's sort of generally where I am. And it's why I can I remain excited about working with my colleagues uh, at the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict uh, on the religion or uh, on the climate narratives project. So one thing that that project just concluded that I, I think is, is worth mentioning to your listeners because it, it's just a very innovative uh, project. Um, the grant sponsored uh, a prize 
and the jury for that prize was a seminar with both undergraduate and graduate students. So they read a series of um, nominated uh, high profile works of nonfiction uh, from journalism and mass media on climate change and awarded one uh, a, a climate narratives prize really based around its ability to navigate these questions of, of hope and fear. Uh, Meehan Christ's uh, 2020 essay from the London Review of Books on um, Should I Have a Child? Uh, mm -hmm. It's about reproduction in the age of climate crisis. Um, that was the ultimate winner. Uh, and other strong entries from people like Emily Rabiteau and others um, were in that, in that. So I, I just think it's a really cool project. And I think the, that we plan on having that uh, prize maybe be uh, a biannual kind of uh, event. So we're, we're gonna keep working on that because we wanna lift up and celebrate um, public voices who are mm -hmm. contributing in, in innovative new ways to the, the broader conversation about climate narratives and attentive to these apocalyptic issues. Uh, we'd also like to advance, there's some grad students here who are working in these areas. Um, Rob Fuller is a doctoral student in history here who's thinking about um, uh, American evangelicals, apocalyptic discourse, survivalism, uh, et cetera. And so we're, we're looking for, to ways to, to support and amplify his work. Um, yeah, that's what the project's kind of been up to lately. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you for that. And I will find a link for your uh, new book and post that in the show notes and awesome. the episode description. And I'll also put a link in there for Devoted to Nature as well. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate oh, it. Of course, of course. Um, last question is, where can people go to find out more about you and your work? So you're welcome to go to my faculty profile page at Arizona State University. Uh, just if you Google... Evan Berry ASU, it'll come right up. Um, but I would also encourage people who are interested interested in this broader set of issues uh, to check out the International Society for the Study of Religion, Nature, and Culture. Um, that's a, a research-based organization. It's international. And we hold conferences roughly every other year. Uh, the next conference will be in early 2023 with uh, you would be able to participate online and also at several locations, but there'll be a sort of mothership location here in Arizona State. Um, that organization for anybody who's doing research or scholarship or wants to learn more can be a great resource. So check it out. And, and uh, if that's something you're interested in, uh, expect a call for papers for that upcoming conference pretty soon. Okay, wonderful. Well, Evan, thank you so much for your time and your insight. It has been greatly appreciated. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I really enjoyed the conversation too. Thank you for having me, Nicholas. Okay, well, thank you. And that's a wrap on episode 39 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you're part of my YouTube audience. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. It only takes a second and your five-star ratings really do help. If you have a minute to spare, consider posting a short but positive review and please consider subscribing. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. I've been releasing episodes weekly and would like to continue doing so. I'm also working on creating additional video content for the YouTube channel, including some more book reviews, educational videos on topics concerning spirituality, the history of religion, and the religious response to the climate crisis. But that extra content takes a lot of time and work. If you would like to support me in creating free and credible material on YouTube and continuing with this podcast, please consider making a one-time donation via PayPal. You can find a link for that in the video description or show notes. Your support makes this podcast possible. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.